Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff, and I'll be your host for the show. Before we bring on tonight's guest, if you've had a Dogman Encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, please go to bigfooteyewitness.com and submit a report. Tonight's guests are Art and Sherry. Art and Sherry, welcome to the show. Thank you. Hello. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks so much for being on the show. I appreciate it. Sherry, please give us a brief bio on yourself. I am born and raised in the mountains, southwest Virginia. Uh, I was in the Army for eight years as a military police officer. I work now as an office administrator. I have two daughters that are grown. One daughter is married. The other one uh, is working and going to school. And I live on a 29-acre farm in Middle Tennessee. And we have four dogs. Uh, We have... Uh, a barn, a spring house. We have the best water that anyone could ever wish for coming out of the mountain that we have every day. And we have beautiful property, our property borders, other farms, our closest neighbors probably at least a mile away. And our closest neighbors are cows <laughs> <laughs> and the other animals that are in our forest. We are right in the middle of the woods. We moved out here about a week before Thanksgiving 2017. It sure sounds to me like you two have carved out a really good life for yourselves. I'm jealous. It's nice. It's beautiful out here. I love it. It's just (laughs) gorgeous. Well, I can understand why you would. And by the way, thank you for your service to our country. Oh, thank you. Oh, no, you're welcome. You are welcome. How about you, Art? Arthur Robinson. I was born in New Bedford, Massachusetts. I've been a martial artist and a musician pretty much my whole life, uh, as well as an outdoorsman. Um, I did some hunting back in the day uh, up in Maine and New Hampshire, uh, a little bit of moose hunting, some black bear. Um, moved down to uh, Nashville, Tennessee in 2004. Uh, for music, of course. <laughs> um, been staying in the woods. I had a ranch when I first moved down here in Watertown, uh, Tennessee, and that was about 15, 20 miles from here. Um, and then now we're here, and uh, it's, you know, as Sherry said, 29 acres up uh, out in the middle of the forest, <laughs> and uh, you know we love it. But um, yeah, we have a. Uh, a lot of things going on out here, actually. Yeah, sure sounds like you do. And I could understand why you would love it, everything except for the dogman problem you have. Well, you know, the dogman situation as uh, as it stands, you know, of course it's, it's a scary thing because this is, you know, you're dealing with a, an apex predator for one. Um, very quiet, you know, stealthy. Uh, and this is, you know, their terrain, really. I mean, when you get out into the woods where there's no street lights and stuff like that, that's when, that's when it gets pretty wild, you know. And, uh, we've managed, knock on wood, to keep it pretty cool <laughs> for the most part. You know, we've had the sightings and stuff. Um, you know, I make a lot of racket. There's, uh, there's a few different methods that, you know, it's really a primal situation. So there's a few different methods that, you know, I've kind of resorted to, and it seems to be doing the trick thus far. (laughs) Yeah, from our first conversation, it sounds like it is. I just hope it stays that way. Right. We do, too. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I understand. I do understand. Sherry, before you two started having all these experiences with dog men, the ones that you've had, What were your thoughts on the possibility such things existed? I had never even thought about it. I mean, of course, I've seen the movies of, like, werewolves and things like that, but I had no idea about them actually existing. 
I had definitely didn't have any idea that Middle Tennessee and Kentucky was like the home of Dogman until I started seeing them and researching it. I was just like blown away, completely blown away. Yeah, you never do expect to hear that you've got something like that in your neighborhood, right in your own backyard. No, I, I surely didn't. It's like a something out of my deepest, darkest nightmare. I can understand why you'd say that. How about you, Art? What were your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I've always kept an open mind uh, as I've had some experience with, with a few other things in the past in the woods and uh you know i've always kept an open mind but really i mean heck you know you just really don't ever truly kind of know until you see it (laughs) and that's when it makes all the difference in the world man yeah seeing is believing right right now i understand well we've got a lot to talk about tonight so let's get into it now Since all of your encounters have happened on or near your property yard, please tell us about the area where you live. Well, the area is very thickly covered. There's a ton of trees. Uh, We live down an old dirt road, you know, way back in a holler, way out in the mountains here. So, you know, uh, we're miles from, you know, the nearest town where we don't have any cell phone service out here. We are 29 acres in the center of a couple thousand. There's a couple of farms that are probably, I want to say, about a thousand yards each way, but there's nothing but land all around us. Uh, even when I've gone trekking the mountain out here hunting, deer hunting and, and such, uh, you know, you can walk all day and, and, you know, just keep on going it's you're just not going to run into anything out here it's just all it's woods and the cows uh on each side there's some folks way down on the left side and folks way out on the right side that have cows that pretty much kind of free graze the area and uh that's pretty much what you'll see in fact there was just one kind of hollering out here in the in, out in the dark field just now so yeah it's pretty remote it sure sounds like it Like I've said before, and I'll say it again, it sure does sound like my kind of country. It sounds beautiful. It it really is. It really is. It's it's gorgeous. You know, you just, uh, when when you come out in the sunrise, and we got a nice, uh, beautiful running creek in the the front yard, and, uh, you know, just, uh, we're on the uh, backside of a mountain, and uh, you just, uh, you can see the mountains all around, and we got a real, really nice... uh, deer hunting out here and i've seen some of the biggest turkey in in my life i mean (laughs) big and just tons of them at times so there's loads of good hunting out here you know i've seen bobcat and all kind of stuff so it's it's wilderness you know coyotes run through the yard (laughs) uh you know we hear them quite quite often and uh you know we've kind of we had to battle them back too so we're in the sticks, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. It sounds like an Eden to me, minus the dogmen, of course. True, true. It it really is, and uh, we're very faithful people, so the Lord's definitely had his hands upon us in this instance. Yeah, sounds like he has. All right, Sherry, please tell us all about your encounters. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. The first encounter that I had happened after we had been on this property for maybe about a month. Uh, We moved in like the week before Thanksgiving, and this happened like right before or right after Christmas. I was working, driving for Lyft at the time, and so I had very erratic late hours. Sometimes I'd be home two in the morning, sometimes daylight. I just, just depended on uh, the commute and how busy I was working. And one night I got to the property and I think Art told you that we have a creek that runs in front of the house. And if the water's down low enough, I hopscotch across the rocks in the creek or we have a footbridge and a walkway that comes up to the cabin. Uh, I had come home and I was getting my backpack out of the back of my car. There was no light out here whatsoever. I mean, you can't 
see your hand in front of your face after dark. I had a flashlight app on my cell phone that I would turn on so I could get all my stuff and then light my way getting over to the house. And I had opened the trunk, got my flashlight app going, and I got my backpack out, and I reached up to close the trunk of the car, and my flashlight glanced across the front yard. And I saw something I did not know that existed on this planet. It was like something out of uh, one of my worst nightmares. I only saw it from its chest down. Um, It had a very broad chest. It was like a cinnamon or a sandy color. It had really long arms, and I saw fingers, and they were curled up, and its arms were pulled up in front of its chest. And the waist got smaller, and then its legs were like that of a dog's hind legs. I think I kind of went into a state of shock, to be honest with you. I was out in the middle of, if this thing would have wanted to kill me, it could have been on me in a second. And I just, I had it fixated in my mind, get to the door, get inside, just get get inside the house. So I went across the creek, thank goodness the water was down low enough that I would just kept, I didn't look to see if it was coming towards me. I was too scared to look back to see where this thing was. I didn't hear anything. Uh, And as soon as I got to the door, I thanked God because I was praying all across the creek that I'd make it to the house. And Art met me at the door, and I told him what I had seen. And he actually told me about an encounter that he and his brother had had earlier. Um, It scared me out of my mind that first time. I had never, ever even dreamed about something like that existing. Probably about a week after the first encounter that I had, I couldn't sleep one night, and I came into the living room. I laid down on the couch, and it was probably about one or two in the morning, and we have a pit bull that stays in the house with us. And he, he, his hair went into full mohawk on his back and he started growling at the front door and then he would run to the window in the living room and growl and then he'd run back to the front door again. I was too scared to look out to see what was outside the door because I kind of figured I knew what was snooping around again. Um, and I just prayed again. And eventually he quit. The next morning it had rained and there was quite a bit of mud. And we got, we actually got a really good picture of a print in the mud. And it looks like a huge dog print that's the size of a dinner plate. And we still have the picture. Um, my next encounter that I had happened probably a couple of weeks after that. Again, I was driving for Lyft, and I was coming home very, very late. And I think Art told you that we live up a holler. That's what we call it here in Tennessee is a holler. And there's an old abandoned house that's probably about a half a mile down towards the main road from our property. And there's this big tree out in front of this house. And as I rounded the bend coming around, I saw the most beautiful dog creature that uh, it was just, it had to be a female. That's the only way I can describe it. She was beautiful. She had like cinnamon colored. uh, She was like down on all fours. She was crouched. But she was smiling at me. It's the only way I can describe it. And her eyes were amber. They were just magically beautiful. And she actually, uh, she sent me like a little psychic message. I know this sounds crazy, but I, I got a really strong message from her. I did not feel scared of her. 
And the message I got from her was, we see you, we know you see us, and we will not hurt you. There will be no harm. And I just had this most tremendous feeling of peace about it after that. Not that I'm not still scared, but I think she knew that I was very scared. And she wanted to reassure me somehow, but she did. She sent me like, she's a very, they're very psychic. Um, I know a lot of times, uh, I've, I've read now that people say that they can be very negative with it, but the message that I got was very positive. And I'm very thankful for that encounter because it, I still get very, very scared especially if I'm coming home after dark. But I kind of just say my prayers and remember that message that I got. And I kind of try to have some peace about it. The last encounter that I had, I was actually driving again. Um, This was probably last December uh, 2018. And, of course, it gets dark very early, so I was driving home in the dark again. And I have to cross a mountainous road that is just all farmland. And there's one huge farm that it's a cornfield. And evidently, the farmer was cutting down the corn stalks for the winter. As I got to the top of the hill... I saw this bright light on a piece of farm equipment. And I couldn't tell if he was close to the road or maybe in the road, so I started to slow down. And as I got around closer, there's kind of a ravine that the field goes into. And I saw that he was over in the field, so I thought, okay, I'm I'm okay. I'm not going to hit him or anything. And a dog man spidered across the road in front of my car. That's the only way that I can describe this. It was a gorgeous creature. It had copper fur. It had the head of a dog. I saw it completely. And it had a long tail. It was black at the top, and then the longest part of the tail was white. And he spidered right across in front of him. I thought I was going to hit him for a second. But he was getting away from that piece of farm equipment, and the farmer was cutting down all these stalks. He spidered right across in front of my car in the road. And that's the last time that I have seen one. Many times that I would get home, and I remember one night vividly, uh, I laid down uh, to go to sleep, and I heard something kind of plop on the front porch. Our bedroom is right by the front porch, and I heard a low, guttural growl, and it scared me really, really bad. But that was like before all these other encounters. This was like when we first moved out here. It's like something had followed me home, and that's what I heard. How much did that communication you said you had with the dog woman help the anxiety you feel when they come around? With her, it helped me quite a bit, but I can't help but still, I have a tremendous fear. I'm I'm very thankful to have had that experience, and I'm so thankful that she actually knew that I needed to see that or hear that from her, but I will always have a tremendous fear. I try to not be outside at all after dark if I can, if I can help it. If I, like in the winter time, I'm driving home and I'm scared. I just can't help it. I got to get from the car into the house and I, I just can't help but be, I have a lot of anxiety. Well, I can understand why you would, but please don't lose sight of the fact that if they wanted to hurt you, they've had who knows how many chances to do that. Oh, yes. That first that first night, that creature, it could have it could have taken me out in a half a second. I was so close to it. And it didn't 
bother me at all. I just saw it, and it was gone. I didn't hear anything. Uh, I know that they could have already wiped us out if they wanted to. They could have. It's good you realize that. I know it's only going to help so much, but when you have a situation like the one that you two have going, any little bit helps. It sure does. <laughs> it, I'm very thankful to her that she gave me that message because it did help a lot. Because I do want to stay out here. I love this property. Do you think you saw the same dog man more than once when you had the three other encounters you just told us about? Or do you think they were three different dog men? I'm thinking that the one that I saw the first night at my vehicle with my flashlight, I think she was the same one I may have seen at the house. Because we we were like so close. It was almost like a face-to-face. I didn't see her face that night from the car, but she showed it to me on the road. And it was pretty much that she had the same color. So I'm thinking that she gave me the message, we see you, we know you see us. So I think that was her way of letting me know that we had already been face-to-face. Well, you know what they say, eyes are the windows to the soul. If you had to describe her eyes, how would you? They were a fiery amber. They were magical. There was like sparks in her eyes. They were sparkling. It was magical. It was just a very magical experience. And from what you said, the only source of light that night was the light on your phone? Yes, the flashlight app from my phone. And then when I saw her face, It was just the headlights of my car lit her up. I see. That makes sense. Okay, Art, it's your turn now. Please tell us about your encounters. Well, I did spend quite a lot of time out here by myself. Um, At the time, Sherry was working two different jobs, and uh, she was gone till wee hours in the morning most of the time. And I would stay up to uh, make sure she got in the house all right and most of that is not only am i really protective um i've had as i said some experiences in watertown i lost a couple dogs very strangely and sort of brutally so that's always kept me on alert when i would be out here at the house usually Usually, a lot of times when it rained, most of the times it seems that they move in the rain. The dog man moves in the rain. Uh, it muffles the sound, uh, especially when it's the real heavy mountain rains out here. Um, I just, I, I, it makes all the sense in the world to me too, but most of the time it's when it's, it's when it's raining that, uh, a lot of the things have occurred. Um, one, evening in particular i was i was here and uh, i was just picking on my guitar a little bit and uh, i kind of heard some weird just weird kind of scratching here at the front of the front of the deck and the dogs started going berserk um now the dogs are on the back deck i've got them set up in kennels um as i said from uh the experience in the past with uh, you know, the dogs being taken from me like that. Um, you know, I keep them pretty much very, very safe in that way. Um, so they have the kennels and they get their outdoor time and I make sure that, that that's monitored. Um, we're here. You know, one of the strange things I kind of saw initially when we moved here was there were a couple of dog leashes that were on some random trees and seemed like they had been snapped. So that was kind of strange to me in the beginning as well. This particular night, I heard some scratching, and uh, I was on alert. Um, I knew roughly that Sherry was roundabout in the the realm of going to be coming home. So I was up, and I was looking out the window, and, you know, from from our front window, uh, you know, in the winter, you can see the road here through the trees so I would always kind of pay attention and wait for her to see her headlights so I could get up and come out on the front porch and sort of usher her in and there was times where she may have been carrying stuff so I'd meet her across the 
the creek and grab that stuff and whatnot. The dogs were going crazy. I, I had this big old galvanized pipe and a machete. <laughs> I went outside and I kind of, I, I sort of knew, so I burst the door open and I kind of come out yelling and, and smacking the, the pipe around. Well, the dogs went into a really eerie silence and when I looked over at them, they were sort of, they were sort of looking at me where they were just kind of backed up in their kennels a little bit. It wasn't, you know, they would, they just, they were just acting strange. So I kind of soothed them for a moment and came inside and then, uh, it really, really, really started pouring. I mean, it was a waterfall coming off the roof in, in front of the house here. And, uh, Sherry had come home and, she was really, really tired, and I was sort of up still, and I just, I got this really strange feeling, and my big boy, my, my bull mastiff, he doesn't normally bark unless there's really something in the yard, and he was, he was really getting aggressive for, for a few moments there, so I jumped up, grabbed the pipe, and I came out onto the front deck, and uh, I also grabbed a, a, fl a flashlight that we have. Uh, it was like a, you know, a nice, real nice, uh, like police issue flashlight. And uh, when I came out onto the deck, I sort of kind of came out huffing and puffing, and I looked off to the right side of the house, and I looked off into the front yard, and I just got a feeling. And at the time, it was completely pitch black out here. We do have a street light now that uh, Sherry had had put in. Uh, what was that last year? Yeah. Um, but you know, that helps it, it covers the front yard here in, in about a, you know, 40 by 65 patch. Uh, but off to my 10 o'clock, off into the corner of the yard down near the creek, I happened to shine the light that way really quickly. And I was completely shocked because, you know, you, you kind of, when you're in the woods, you know, of course you kind of, you can be a little bit freaked out just initially because you're alone. <laughs> There's no service. It's, you know, you're out in the middle of nowhere initially. And we had first moved here, but when I put the light, I all, all of a sudden I saw the two biggest green eyes just staring back at me. And I'm telling you, they were, they were at least the size of like traffic lights and pretty much just as much illuminated when I, put the light there and uh i mean geez it almost sort of reminded me of just you know you could see the eyes it was just a big wolf it was you know the head it was as wide at least as wide as my shoulders because there's like a, a there's like a six foot piece of fencing over there and it's about four and a half feet high and the head was over the fence looking straight at me and it was every it was it seemed like it was a very dark color because I couldn't really see it completely clearly but you could tell by the shape of the eyes and then there was just enough outline of the head that I could see that it that it, this was a dog man or werewolf or what have you staring right back at me and then I mean of course the first initial for me was a split second of, oh my God, you know, am I really laying eyes on what I'm looking at? And then I happened to have a, a, a knife my brother gave me that was, dang, you know, I had it uh, around my neck. So you could kind of pull it from your chest, you know? And I pulled it from my chest and looked at this thing and just reared up and just yelled. I just, you know, and it blinked at me sort of turned its head sideways just a little bit and then looked back at me again and blinked again and turned and just sort of like dipped down into the creek. And then about a day or two later, I went out and, and out down there and I looked around and you could see where there was a pathway of the grass that was still kind of high in that little area there along the creek bed was patted down and then when you looked off into the wood line you could literally see where it was like a right step left step right step left step of 
the grass and mud sort of being, you know, pushed down. So that was, that was the first experience. And that was one of the first experiences that happened in, in the beginning. Shortly after that, my brother was with me, uh, for like Christmas to New Year's. And we were here, we were, you know, just messing around. And, you know, he, he was really anxious to kind of, get outside and mess around with the property and, and we had a little fire going and, and all that stuff. And then we decided to kind of walk around out back in the mountain and see if we might see any deer or anything out there. So we started trekking up the mountain and next thing you know, we both, you know, my brother and I are not easily scared. We're not really easily scared guys, but we were alert. And then as we started getting further from the house, we could still see the house. The house, I probably still could have hit it with a baseball. But uh, we started going up a little bit further, and then we sort of got really, you know, the ad- adrenaline sort of, you know, kicked in and, uh, you know, a little bit of goosebumps, and it was like, hmm. And we heard a little bit of like a, a like a huff. Now, it wasn't like a black bear huff or chatter, which I've heard before, and I'm, I'm sure you kind of, you know, you're familiar with too, but... uh it was definitely different, and I don't know what we were thinking, but we sort of started headed towards it. Well, as we started getting within about 40 yards of this huff, we heard it again off to our 5 o'clock. So we spun around, and at this point, my brother and I got back to back. Then we kind of found that we were a little further from the house and just kind of wondering, what are we getting surrounded here? And then, lo and behold, Right behind us, as we were facing the five o'clock, next thing you know, right behind us, boom, another like huff kind of snort. And then I happened to catch out of the corner of my eye a being standing down by the house. And in the back light, we have a, we have porch lights in the back and it lights up a good little section of the backyard. Well, I double took. And then I looked down and I was staring at a, I want to say between six and a half and seven foot tall, probably about 400 to 500 pounds, cinnamon colored, dog shaped head, just like, uh, like, it looked very similar to the Van Helsing kind of creature. Um, had the hands, uh, curled up in front. Uh, it was definitely like fingers, like long fingers. The body was completely covered, and she, it, she de- it definitely looked like a, f- a female as opposed to the big one that I had seen before. And up leading up to that point, there were a few times where I'd be sitting here in the house. Now, Sherry had mentioned uh, the psychic type of thing. Well, in the beginning, there were times where I was sitting here, and, and uh, yes, it does sound crazy, but it's the truth. Um, I was kind of experiencing just kind of like weird thoughts and weird visions of like hunting and, and being out in the woods and, you know, just kind of sometimes feeling like an, uh, a little bit of an overwhelming rage. I was, I was eating my meat <laughs> more raw and everything. Um, I kind of noticed that that was happening to me and I started fighting that with prayer and it works. That's one of the biggest things that we've actually had to combat any ongoings of any further situations thus far. Um, That and, of of course, a few primal techniques that I've resorted to ultimately because I'm not going to lose any more dogs. I love my woman. (laughs) I'm going to keep us protected. And, you know, this is our home, and we're not going anywhere. And that's one of the biggest things that folks need to know, too, that if they are having an experience, you have to establish your ground. Um, You have to do it in a way that's not threatening either, which is kind of tough to do. So you got to get creative. (laughs) Um, So these experiences here, seeing her down by the side of the house, we got a really clear shot of her. My brother looked at her. He was seeing the same doggone thing I was. Um, And then she slowly, it seemed like she was trying to lure us back to the house or we may have been interrupting a hunt up there because the deer, there's so many deer trails and stuff on the back mountain here. 
um, we may have been interrupting a hunt and she was pulling us out of it. So we didn't think of it at that moment that way. I thought, well, what the heck is that creature down at the house? And as we started to kind of turn to head back down the mountain towards her, she slowly like swayed back and forth left to right and slowly stepped very inching, you know, just inches back very slowly until she ended up back in the shadows and completely out of view. By that time we were about halfway down back to the house and we, and my brother went left and I come to the right. So I, I come around by the front yard and he went by the back and, uh, we heard some, a little bit of crashing off in the brush. It was, it was really far off into the brush by the time we got down here now, probably a good 40 yards, but you could still hear some branches cracking and stuff. And uh, a little while after we came in the house and we figured that we'd kind of wait, wait it out a little bit and then sort of kind of rush out. You know, again, I don't know exactly what we were thinking other than maybe, you know, just it was that, that primitive instinct to, to protect the property and the dogs. Um, that's pretty much what was driving us, uh, you know, coupled with adrenaline. A little while later, we we had kind of burst out a little bit and kind of looked around, and we didn't really hear anything. So we kind of retreated back into the house and just sort of decided to relax. Uh, I want to say it was about three or four hours later, and again, we have no cell phone service out here, no way to communicate. And when Sherry got home, I heard her pull in. I saw the lights, so I got up, and then... It took a second for me to get to the door, and she was already coming across the bridge. And I'm and I'm saying, I said to her, "Hello," and she goes, "Oh my God, oh my God!" When she got up to the door, she was white as a ghost, and she said that a, a, a creature very, very much the same that we saw, other than of course she said she didn't see the head at that point, but we did, and then she had her experiences. So now. Shortly after that, I want to say it was maybe, maybe about two months roughly. Um, we had been grilling out and we would, you know, I put down a big, you know, hamburger steaks on the grill. And of course, you know, that's been known to draw things in. Well, next thing I know, the very next day when Sherry was leaving, as soon as she turned out of the driveway, my pit bull and I had walked her out to the car. And when she got in the car, we were, we had already turned around and gotten back on top of the first part of the bridge and we and we're watching her drive off. When she turned out the driveway, her, my dog and I turned around and took the first couple steps back over the bridge. And as soon as I took that second step, I heard cow cow and I mean it was so loud. It, both the dog and I jumped a foot off the deck and we looked at each other, eyes wide open as we were still in stride to head towards the house. And I heard it about five more times. Now we're talking, we're talking maybe 40 yards away and it was so loud. It just echoed through the holler. And, and I heard this creature running up the, the, the mountainside on that side of the road in the tree line and it just kept going tow, tow, tow. like it was just so loud and you could still hear it all the way up all the way up to another tree line that's got to be I want to say 500 yards from here uh, from from the front porch by the time I got to the front porch it was on that tree line and I could still hear it so I ran inside and grabbed my phone and came back outside and I caught the last couple off in the distance, but you can still hear the the power behind it as far as it was. Um, so that was that. Then I want to say it was maybe within a week, Sherry and I took off early in the morning. It was about 6.30 in the morning. And as we got, I want to say maybe 200 feet down the road out of the driveway, this creature come running out from right to left and 
again, I've I've seen black bear in the wild. I've I've you know, it wasn't a black bear. It was it was twice the size of my bull mastiff, and he's about 130 pounds, 140 pounds, and it had a a little bit darker of a of a cinnamony color, but it went booking. And then there's like a there's like a little ravine and a and a little upward uh, ledge, grass ledge. And then there was a a wire fence, a cow fence that's you know it's about five foot high. So collectively with that little trench there, and then the fence, you know, you're looking at probably around seven foot off the road and this thing booked across the road in like a bound and then when it hit the ground on the other side of the road it jumped up over that fence and it was gone gone and we just looked at each other and could not believe our eyes um and i want to say that that was a pup and it was right around the, the timing where you know after i had a head-to-head with the male like that then the female kind of said well you caught us you saw us uh you know she helped us out <laughs> getting out of the middle of a hunt up on the mountain um i think she was kind of letting us know that they may have been getting ready to have pups i believe with all my heart that that was a pup that ran across the street um then i want to say within a week or two after that sherry come home and she says ah you got to go down the street and see this you got to go down the street and see this there's a a spine in the road and i'm going huh she says there's a spine in the road go down and it's right near the abandoned house down there which when you go by this house it always feels like there's something weird over there but i i said all right i'll go check it out and i got down there and i also got footage of a deer carcass that is unlike anything i've ever seen before even even roadkill on the side of a busy freeway doesn't look like this there was not a piece of meat left on this thing not an organ not a tongue no eyes nothing it was ripped clean and twisted three times around like a wet rag um i got footage of that and as i was getting footage of it it almost seemed to me like the way it looked because sherry all she saw was a, a about a foot of the spine that was in the street but when i got up to where it was off a little bit on the grass side and there's, a, there's the creek runs right down on that side right there is where the deer carcass was and there's a little crossing between the trees that goes into a huge green field and into a a big area where it's very mountainous and it's actually like a big bowl on that side kind of looks like something out of planet of the apes it's really wild over there um but they there's a lot of crossing going on in that area um deer turkey and what have you that's following them so that area is very very busy and i got the footage and as i was getting the footage of this deer and just kind of couldn't believe what i was seeing in the way that it looked uh i heard a a snuff a snort very similar to what my brother and I were hearing up up here on the mountain in the backyard and it sent shivers across my whole body and and at that point I look up and I start walking away really quickly and get back in the car and then I go down the road a little ways and went to turn around and as I started turning around you know, you have your gut instinct. And if I didn't have my woman and my dogs over here at the house, you know, I was actually afraid to come back down the road for a moment there. I know they're big, strong. I mean, I I even ride a motorcycle and, and I haven't been riding it lately just because I get home now at really late hours or early morning and just the ride through the back roads here and stuff that late and all the things that go running across the road. And when you're coming down the hollow, it really feels like something's running along the woods line over here, kind of ready to pounce, you know. And uh there's been times where I feel fine and comfortable getting off my motorcycle over on the other side of the creek and walking up to the house. But then there's times where it's like, whoa, <laughs> what's that? Let me put a little you know, a little bit more pep in my step here and get in the house. So yeah, that's, that's another, uh, another experience was the pup. 
And then um, we also, when Sherry's son-in-law had come over one time, her daughter and, and her son-in-law, and he wanted to go up on the mountain, and he just got a new handgun, so we were going to go up and shoot. And uh, as we started going up the mountain, we noticed that the brush was pushed down pretty good. Now, the cows, they do it, and they, they mow through some stuff, but they do it a different way. This was like trail padded down, and it... There's little rock ledges that overlook deer trail, and it's perfect ambush area. Um, we just noticed that it was getting pushed down awfully strangely, where it looks like padded feet are pushing it down. And, and uh, as we started getting up there, now it was broad daylight, but as we got about three quarters of the way up, we noticed that it was just really, there was just a really strange feeling really strange it was time to turn around and get back down to the house so i looked at him and i said you want to keep going and he says no <laughs> let's turn around i said all right so as we started heading back down we came around a turn that's that's up there and as we come around the turn we saw another footprint now this footprint it, it was a really good one it was it's it had to be about two or three inches deep and i'm saying that that this was about as deep as where the cow hoof prints are going into the mud in that area when it rains. This was just as deep, so I want to say it's got to be about the same weight as one of these. Not not the biggest bulls, but probably about you know one of the heifers, which is probably about eleven to fifteen hundred pounds. I got this print that you can see the toes now. Sherry's son-in-law, he's about 6'3", and I think he weighs like about a 12. And when he put his foot down in this footprint now, he still could put the palm of his hand right to where your fingers start on your hand. That's how much more was in front of it. So it, it had to be a, a, a 16, if not 17-inch print. Um, Just really, really clear. And we've noticed... Over time in the, in this area, now every now and again that you'll see a cow or two that gets sort of separated from the herd. And then when they get out into the field here, they just seem completely confused. They don't know what's going on. And then next thing you know, they're getting pushed further off into the bush. And then I don't know what's happening to them, but it's happened quite a few times where, uh, you know, all of a sudden there'll be one and it's just way further away from any of the you know any of the other herd and it just seems like it keeps getting pushed east just keeps getting pushed so uh those are uh, a lot of the experiences that we've had you know along with different howls i have footage of the coyotes around the area so you can clearly distinguish the two not long ago i want to say within a month i was cooking a london broil here on the grill and I got some more howls off the front deck, and they were probably about a hundred yards across the street in the brush line. And then that was followed by some coyote action, which seems to happen in a triangular pattern out here on the property. And it seems like every time the coyotes are sort of running in the area, the dogmen are right behind them or they're right in front of them, and they sort of run parallel to that triangle and right up the middle of it too we've also had some experience out here with military helicopters we had uh one night in particular uh i kind of jumped up because i heard what sounded like trampling across the front yard and seconds later there was a helicopter that i could have thrown a rock at off the off the front yard. I thought it was going to land right in our yard. And it hovered over our house for, I want to say, a solid 30 seconds. And then there's a tree line that runs up the mountain here on the, on the right side of the house, if you're facing the house. And that chopper was right above the front yard, or right over the house here. And, I mean, everything was shaking. Even the, the fixtures on the, the lamps and stuff were shaking. It was so close. And it went right up the side of the mountain here, and then it was up at the top of the mountain for about 15, 20 minutes hovering. And, uh, you know, there was another time where the gentleman that owns the property off to the right side of the house, which is quite a bunch of acres, but he's got a couple of deer stands. He's got a ground blind and a, 
a tree blind out back here. And uh, it, that's about, I want to say, about 200, 250 yards away from my porch, in essence. And uh, one morning, he was coming up the tree line in his side-by-side, and it was still dark out. I want to say it was about 4 o'clock, maybe 4.30 in the morning now. And he come up, and that's what woke me up. The dogs were barking, and they were, you know, they, they were barking uh, that get up, get up, bark, hey, there's something out here, bark too, you know. So I, I said, all right, well, there's the guy with the side-by-side, you know, thanks for waking me up at 4 o'clock in the morning. And next thing I know is he turned to head towards his deer stand, and his tail lights. I saw the complete silhouette of a dog man step out to the left, right into the light of the tail lights, and I could see the back, the head. This one was was much bigger than the other one, as far as like width wise. It was probably double at the shoulders, no neck, that like a uh, bent leg. You know, I, I could just see that silhouette, and it stepped out and looked at him, and it was probably 30 yards behind him as he took the turn. And it was just un- uncomfortably close to the house, and I just turned around and I told Sherry what I saw, and, you know, we went and uh, picked up a shotgun. <laughs> and, uh, you know, since then, every now and again, you'll get a weird feeling out here, you know, but I think, knock on wood, we've done a pretty good job establishing a, a-, a good perimeter the lights definitely help. <laughs> um, but then again, you know, there's times where when we go to bed and stuff, next thing you know, in the middle of the night, the dogs are going berserk. And, you know, our pit bull, he's, a, he's an extremely well-mannered dog. He's very docile. And whenever he gets that mohawk on his back and runs up to the door, you know, we're definitely on high alert because you know something's got to be around. And uh, that's that's our story. <laughs> Yeah, that's quite a set of stories there. Sounds like it's been nonstop. It's definitely been something that's gone on since we've been here. It's consistent. Yeah, sounds like it has been. Have all the dogmen you've seen had the same kind of leg structure, or have some had canine-style legs while others had hominid-style legs? It's just like the back legs of a dog. You know, it's got like that hawk. And the thighs are extremely muscular. I mean, the, the legs make up quite a bit of this animal, actually. And they have very broad shoulders, but their head, especially on the male, that head is so big. <laughs> it's got to be the size of, like, a tractor-trailer tire, man. I mean, it's a big, big boy. Their structure is just, it's very similar to what you see just on sci-fi so i just i wonder sometimes if they know more than what they let us let a lot of people know because it's so accurate i mean like uh you know the van helsing sort of looking but you know it, it's also got that that realistic just you know the gosh it's so hard to describe it's you know you just when you see it you know you're looking at something real it's 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 just like oh lord i mean the the fur, the muscles, the just it's all there. Yeah, that's gotta be a lot to take in. It is. It absolutely is, yeah. It's it's I mean, you know, I wouldn't say it's a level of PTSD so to speak, but I mean, you know, it's etched in my brain for you know, I'll never forget any of the the sightings that I've seen. Well, I can understand why you wouldn't. You told us about the huge print that you found that was so much bigger than Sherry's son-in-law's size 12 shoe. Was that print round in shape like a dog print or hominid style and somewhat elongated? That one was a little bit more hominid style, but but you could see the toes and the claws. And it almost looked... You know how the dog's paw is and then they have like that little bend before it kind of goes up into their their like knee i guess that's it looks like when it came around the corner the way the mud was it sort of pressed its paw in and then that little back part sort of 
bent down just a little bit so it could catch that turn and co- and go back up and jump up the mountain or something. You know what I mean? Because there was another a left footprint that was about ten foot away, between eight and ten foot away, that had the toe marks, and it was just the like the ball of a, the foot sort of, which looked a lot more canine. Now the one on the side of the house that we got there looked just like a giant print of like what my bull mastiffs would look like so i'm not really sure if that second print was like a an ankle bend sort of because it was cutting a turn uphill yeah sounds like you're talking about the hawk the hawk is basically the heel on a dog that's always almost always off the ground that is but Dogmen, when they're in muddy areas and if they're in another type of uh, terrain where they need a little more traction when they're turning, for example, sometimes they will put that hawk down to give themselves a little more purchase. It sounds like that might be what you're looking at there. Exactly. That's Yeah, that's that's exactly what it, it was. It was like it, this, this bad boy was like cutting a turn. And when it got that right, that when it dug that right foot in, it sort of sunk just a little bit so that back hawk came down into the print and it sprung up out of that for that left foot to catch that little little lip sort of where it was you know it was like a little rocky a little rocky muddy lip with that left foot you know and uh that's that's actually the sense of it all that hawk must have touched that because uh the front of it definitely had that the t- the toes the nails, and it was very much the same size, if not just a little bit bigger than the one that we got on the side of the house. Uh, the one on the side of the house, I took a step with my boot, and I wear a 10 and a half, 11 wide, and I stepped down right next to the print, and the whole, like, if you were to go from your instep, right where your instep is, to the tip of my toes and my boot, is how long that print is, and it was probably an inch wider than my foot. Wow, yeah, that's a pretty big print. Yeah, and and given the fact that it had been raining all night too, the quality of it still, I mean, it had it had plenty of detail still left. You can see it in the photo. You can see it. It looks just like it was just sort of just standing there looking in the window. And a lot of times I, you know, we'll get like feelings every now and again where, you know, you'll kind of feel where something's looking in the window. You can, you can just tell, you know, but I think they do a pretty doggone good job of staying stealthy though. I mean, they, I think they know too. It's, it's just like a lot of animals in the wild, even, you know, predators, if they come clash to clash in the woods, they may battle a little bit. A lot of times it may be life or death, but sometimes they'll battle and they respect the fact that they're hunters. So they'll get that battle in and it's like, all right, you won and they'll move on. You know, you see it a lot of times in, in bears and, and stuff like that. And I'm just, you know, even with the, uh, with wolves and, and coyotes, you know, they, they have their pecking order and stuff like that. And that's partly how I've had to handle the situation out here. Just, just, you know, we have to stand our ground. And even though it can be an extremely frightening situation, it's just like, I guess I've had, I've had it in my mind to just handle it in a sense where if you kind of, you know, stick your chest out and just stand your ground, even though there may be that little bit of fear in you, it's like meeting a, somebody with a, with a, you know, a Rottweiler or something, you know, you don't want to show fear or the dog's going to get leery. And I think they kind of realize that, you know, you know, we're here to stay, and they got their thing going on, we got our thing going on, and as long as we don't get in each other's way, everything's cool, you know? Well, I'm glad you seem to have an amicable relationship with them. That's a lot better than the alternative, at least. The way it's been, I think, uh, you know, also, too, I mean, we didn't, you know, we don't have a choice. This is our home. <laughs> you know, so we had to stand our ground. I know I'm a lot different than a lot of average people, too. You know, I I, I sing, I'm, I'm loud, I... I make a lot of noise. That's another thing too. Like you know, whenever I'm going to do something with the dogs, or Sherry's going to do something with the dogs, we're sure to be loud. You know, we make noise and kind of it, it helps to kind of alert or scare anything out of the vicinity. You know, if you kind of push a door open loud, maybe you know you got a pipe and you kind of tap the deck a few times or something. You know, 
that's some of the, you know, some technique that folks use in Alaska for grizzly bears and stuff. So, you know, just being creative and being really alert and knowing, you know, we know. So knowing that is, you know, like they say, half the battle, it's, it, it kind of gives us a little bit more ground to stand on knowing that, all right, you know, it's getting dark. It's, you know, we got the dogs done. It's good. Let's, let's hunker everybody down for the night and get inside and, and then we're good, you know, till the next day. So it's just mainly repetition and being alert. And fortunately we've been lucky so far, but it's always keeping it in the back of your mind that there's a possibility you could have a, a, another encounter or something like that. That that runs through our heads every time we pull into the driveway. We're waiting. <laughs> as soon as you come off the main road and come down the hall, or, I mean, you know, you're, you're 75% to 80% expecting something to come boogieing across the road or, or turn into the driveway and catch something in the headlights. It's just that random and that frequent. Yeah, I don't see how you could ever get used to that. <laughs> you never know. It's all about... Uh, we got to live here, man. It's, you know, we got the dogs It's and we do, we, you know, we love it. And, you know, Sherry was an MP and I'm, I'm no slouch myself. So, you know, we're, we're tough. And I'm, it's not to say that we haven't heard, you know, the dogs going berserk or heard something outside. And we've come out here and banging pipes and yelling, Hey, you know, just standing our ground. I think that's what's kept us in the loop so far, you know, and, we love it here, and uh, I think the experiences can be extremely terrifying. Nonetheless, it's also like kind of a, a like a blessing. Well, it's definitely not an easy situation, but it sure sounds to me like you two are handling it as well as it could be handled. So you deserve a lot of credit for that. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. You are welcome. Sherry, when you think about the change in behavior Art experienced after the encounter he had with the dog woman, do you think these things are ethereal entities or flesh and blood creatures? I think that if there could actually be something, they're interdimensional. I think that they could almost be like travelers. And I've also wondered if they can cloak. Those are just things that have entered my mind out of all the ways that we've seen them and experienced them. It's just, they're so stealthy. And to have that kind of ability to speak to me the way she did psychically, they're very magical. So I think that they could almost like travel from other dimensions. It's very difficult for me to, I've kind of tried to open my mind and I've done a lot of research since seeing the dog woman, trying to find out more information as much as I could about them. But they are very special creatures. They are very magical. And I wish that I could learn more about them. Just imagine how much there is to learn. But, yeah, that could take a whole lifetime or more. Yeah, it sure could. Sherry, it might be hard to believe, but there are people listening tonight who think it would be neat to have dogmen living on or around their property. What would you say to someone like that, since that's obviously a reality for you? I think it is very neat, in a way, to have the dogmen around. I've actually thought that, you know, in maybe a certain instance, that it could be a protective thing. Uh, maybe they might keep something that would harm us away. I've thought that it could be a benefit in many ways as well. Well, I like the way you look at things. That's awfully impressive. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, it's about time for us to get out of here. But before we do, Sherry, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Just never be closed-minded. And I know I tried to talk myself out of seeing what I saw. And I had to realize, yes, I did see that. Yes, it is real. These creatures are real. And they are around. I think that we could learn a lot from them. I wish we could learn a lot from them. But 
they are real and they are closer than we ever realized. You make some really good points. I'm sure you're right on all of them. (laughs) I hope so. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. How about you, Art? Do you have any closing comments that you'd like to share? Uh, well, I would definitely say that uh, you gotta sort of be in a, a little bit of a monster to live with monsters. Um, you know, just stay alert, and uh, you know they are real. We've seen them, we've heard them. I'll never forget what I've seen. There's a respect level when you live in a situation like this, and I, I believe that that's been partly what's kept us safe being alert making noise they're out there they're real they're running around in these mountains and they're hunting and they're alive and they're flourishing because i know i saw a pup and uh i'm 100 percent positive that the uh, cinnamon one is a female and the one that i had the first encounter with initially which i think was kind of checking us out see you know where we stood when we moved in here so there's a family situation going on and the level of i want to say you know respect that we've gotten especially when in regards to the the female um these are smart beings and uh These woods are their home, too. So that's mainly where I stand. You know, as long as they keep to their own, we'll keep to ours. And if we we have sightings here and there and whatnot or hear them, then it's all good as long as, (laughs) you know, as long as we're left to be in peace in our little spot, too. And I think that we've done a pretty good job so far of establishing that. It's just mainly keeping it that way and it's something that's consistent it's got to be consistent um because again too you know these are animals and you know as intelligent as they've shown us that they are you know i think that we can learn a lot from each other but that consistency too kind of keeps them they learn patterns too i believe and uh They kind of know when we're coming and going, and I think they may snoop around quite a bit. And but you know they sort of stay to their own now at this point. It was a it was a lot more active in the beginning when it was establishing that perimeter. But they're out there, they're out here, and uh, they're definitely flourishing. Well, if there ever was a couple that was well equipped to deal with your situation, I'd say it's you two. I'm very impressed by how you two have handled it. Gratitude. Tons of gratitude. (laughs) Thank you. You're welcome. You are welcome. But having said that, thanks so much for coming on and sharing your experiences with us. I really appreciate it. Sure. We're glad we were able to share our experiences with you guys. Well, we're glad to have you. Thanks again so much. Have a great night. If you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.